Welcome to the Financial Planning for Canadian Business Owners podcast. You will hear about industry insights with award-winning financial planner and entrepreneur, Jason Pereira. Through the interviews with different experts with their stories and advice, you will learn how you can navigate the challenges of being an entrepreneur, plan for success, and make the most of your business and life. And now, your host, Jason Pereira. Hello and welcome to Financial Planning for Canadian Business Owners. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Before we get started today, just a reminder to sign up for my newsletter at jasonpereira.ca where you'll be informed of all updates to uh, my various media channels. So on today's show, today I brought an old friend, Lee Fernandez of Seidel. Seidel is a company that helps high net worth Canadians set up structures and planning to help meet their needs. I brought him in specifically today to talk about one of the core offerings, which is trust services. So this is kind of a basic education on trusts, how they can be used in some use cases, and why they're a benefit to people. So I hope you enjoy this interview with Lee. Lee, thanks for coming in. You're welcome. Good yeah. morning. Oh, good to see you as always. So Lee Fernandez of Seidel, tell us about Seidel. What is it that you guys do? So Seidel is a Canadian-based global financial services company. We're a private bank, mm-hmm. and so we deal with uh, private clients, both globally and domestic. And the objective is really to work with families to preserve wealth and ensure that the next generation reap the benefits of that preservation. And you guys get into a lot of advanced structure planning and that oftentimes involves trusts. And that's why I brought you in today. We want to cover the topic specifically of trusts. What are they? How can they benefit people? What are some of the use cases and how can you guys support that? So let's start off there. Uh, so let's tell the listenership, what what is a trust? So a trust is first and foremost, not a legal entity in, in Canada. Yeah, it's kind of this weird little gray area. Right, yeah. right. And And so with a trust, you know, essentially what it is, it's uh, when someone has an asset and the intention is to leave that asset for someone else and that someone else is known as the beneficiary. And the technicality of of trusts is that it needs to meet three certainties. Mm -hmm. So a certainty of intent. So if me as an individual, my intention is to set up this vehicle to leave assets to someone else. And that's the certainty of intent. And then the second is certainty of subject matter. And so essentially, what is it that I'm going to leave Mm -hmm. for someone else? Money, assets, shares, whatever it is. Correct, correct. It could be hard assets. It could be monetary assets. And then the third is uh, certainty of object. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of the object is who is the beneficiary? Who's going to benefit? And and that's a technicality of a trust. So it needs to meet those three certainties. And so when we are dealing with clients, the first thing that we ask is, do you have a trust? And if you do, let's look at the the trust deed or the the Mm -hmm. indenture. And let's see what the trust states and let's determine whether those three certainties are there. So essentially what it is, it's a vehicle that's set up that I am able to place my assets into it and then leave it for someone else. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the types of trust that you can have and set up, it's a revocable trust. So one where during my lifetime, I can change the terms of the trust and then an irrevocable trust where trust that's set up, you you essentially... It's cast in stone in the sense that it's not set up and you can't you can't change the terms of those trusts. Yeah. And a simple example of a revocable trust, uh, and a lot of people have seen this, is they want to open up an account or savings investment vehicle for their children. So they will typically be opened in their name in trust for the child. But there's that's a very loose kind of arrangement, right? Like you've named that. Oftentimes that money can be taken back. But regardless, the the formal trust or the the formal trust, the not irrevocable trust. Basically, that is essentially typically drafted by a lawyer. I mean, you can have revocable trusts also drafted by a lawyer, but there's a trust document outlining who's in charge of what, what the terms of the contract are, and what that person is responsible for and who benefits it, as well as making sure those three certainties are hit. Correct. Right. Basically, so essentially what we're doing is we are making sure that something's being taken care of on behalf of someone else. Right? right. And a trustee is appointed to do that, someone who's responsible for that. Correct. So before we dive into what they're responsible for and, and what some of the other parties involved in this are, let's just do Deal with the elephant in the room every time trusts come up. This is often thought of as a tool for the wealthy to basically plan. And oftentimes, due to some accounting scandals and things that have happened internationally, oftentimes it carries a bad name sometimes. People think someone's up to tax evasion. So that specifically happens when you start talking about domestic versus international trusts. And let's address that. I'll let you talk about your viewpoints first, then I'll jump in. So it's a good thing I'm, I'm African. <laughs> so I'm very familiar with elephants and how to handle them. How do you handle them? Um, <laughs> Carefully? Yeah, yeah, with, a lot of, with a lot of care. So the perception exists yes. and it's real purely because when there's a scandal that breaks out, 
invariably there is some trust that's been set up in a tax haven and there are allegations of tax evasion. So, so I understand that perception in the market. The reality is that the use of a trust has, uh, you know, it's so broad. Yeah. And generally speaking, in, in our business, we do see application of trusts for wealthy individuals because of the multi-generational aspect of their planning. And so that, that needs to be said. However, we also deal with uh, individuals where there is a need, irrespective of the amount of wealth that's involved, a need to protect a beneficiary. And the protection could be in the form of a disabled beneficiary, or it could be discourse amongst family members. And they wanna make sure that when matriarch, patriarch are no longer around, that certain siblings aren't going to outcast uh, other other members of the family. So there are very real benefits to a trust outside of yeah. the wealth. At the aspect. end of the day, it's not something that's benign or malignant. It's just something that exists, right? And it really comes down to the intent in which you design it to basically, yeah. To, to basically, yeah. yeah, you can you can try to obfuscate and try to do all sorts of stuff. Or even the most simple, per, you know, simple case where someone doesn't have a lot of wealth, has an insurance policy, has a minor to take care of, disabled or not, you're not going to put large amounts of money in the hands of a child. So that's the responsible thing to do as a trust. Right. But, you know, let, let me, you mentioned domestic and international. Yes, yeah, so let's hit that one specific. So, so, so the, um, the use of um, international trusts, it's still prevalent, but it's more around in terms of what we see in the realm of asset protection. And not to say that you can't have an asset protection trust in Canada, but there's a school of, of thought that if you are setting up a structure and the true intent of that trust is to asset protect, then look at a different jurisdiction as opposed to your home jurisdiction. Yeah. And so an asset protection trust does not cross any tax line. So the, it's tax so neutral. So I'm, I'm paying neutral. the same tax. CRA, yeah. you declare that and they're aware that the, the structure is being set up. Mm -hmm. And so from a CRA perspective, that trust essentially doesn't exist because yeah. it's attributed back to the individual that set up the trust. But in terms of the legal standing where now the trustee is the, the owner of those assets, and as the assumption here is that it is an irrevocable trust that's been set up, there are jurisdictions that have uh, cure periods or limitation periods that essentially protect those assets in the event of a creditor coming out of the woodwork down the line. Yeah. Let me preface this by saying, when you set up an asset protection trust, if you set it up with the intent of defrauding someone or ensuring that you are now going to, you're now- um, Not going to be exposed to that credit? No, you're insolvent. As insolvent. a result of yep. setting up the asset protection trust, then there's no jurisdiction that will deem that a valid asset protection trust. Yep. So it's got to be a, a true intent, right? And, and let's be clear, these things have to be reported. Right, right to CRA. So I often say that to have an offshore trust and to not report that is the equivalent of some other non-reported offshore stuff I see done. So for example, maybe there's a rental property in the home country of the person comes from and they're not reporting that income to CRA. Correct. You're just as guilty there as if you had set up some elaborate structure involving trust in a foreign domicile. Correct. Also, and I think we take this for granted in Canada specifically when we talk about international trusts, it's that we're, you know, we come from a position of privilege. Like we're in a real, in a very stable country, you know, when looked at other countries, but many other people who come here are coming here from countries that are not stable, right. where they have to worry about governments suddenly deciding one day that, eh, you know what, we're going to take it all, right? Or a big chunk of it, right? So people in those scenarios are far more sensitive to this sort of thing because they get it. And even if they come here, they still don't necessarily trust governments to, to not do that one day. So there's there's a reason to want to protect assets. And again, not from a tax standpoint specifically, because we need to do things about, we're talking about everything we're talking about here is all above board and it's all reported. Yeah. yeah. So so the you speak about individuals past and you know what families have gone through. In my career and coming from South Africa, having done dealt with individuals that have lost everything. It's very prevalent in the thinking. And so with, you know, a lot of clients that I deal with, it's not a, a net worth discussion. You know, I have 10 million, do I qualify for a trust? And, and I get asked that question often. You know, qualify for a trust? Yeah, well, yeah. What is it that I need to have to qualify for a yeah. trust? And it's really not about a net worth. It's around what is it that you need the trust for? Let's have a more meaningful discussion around the use of a trust and what it's going to offer you. And it's generally a discussion around estate planning. Exactly. Right? And, right. and that's uh, and outside of the realm of asset protection. And just to put that aside, most recently we did an asset protection trust for a client that is selling his business and his business is in a very litigious environment. 
And uh, he's just concerned what the new owners are going to end up doing with the business, notwithstanding that he's selling it. He just wants to protect what he has spent 35 years building. And one of the, the thoughts that was uh, put to the client was to set up an asset protection trust. And that's where it works, is that he wants peace of mind. And that's exactly. what it comes down to. And it's peace of mind that during the rest of his life, that those assets have an opportunity to be protected for the next generation and the generation thereafter. Yeah. And again, I think these international scandals do us all a disservice because the general public, they have kind of put a tarnish on this. But really, the reality is, and to my experience, I'm sure you'll say the same thing, trusts are not put in place as the underlying thinking is not taxation. 99% of the time. It comes down to protection as one of the things we talked about, whether that be protection from potentially losing it all or protecting the beneficiary from themselves because they're incapable, but also control, right? Like if I have shares of my company owned through a trust where all my family owners, you know, I wanted to give them all shares, right? I want them to all be shareholders. That's great. But at the same time, I don't want to lose my voting rights, right? I want to control that. So that sort of dimension of control and protection typically ends up being the driving factor behind so many of these trusts that I see put in place versus taxation. Yeah. So I agree to a point. Yeah. The control issue is the biggest stumbling block because when you set up a trust, there's you, a certain way it has to be done. You, yeah. You're essentially relinquishing control of those assets to the trustee. And that's where we spend most of our time uh, with clients is understanding this concept of control. And what does it really mean? Because ultimately, when assets go into a trust, you no longer have control of those assets. So yeah, so let's talk about that. So let's talk about there's three different roles involved specifically with, with trusts, right? So we talked about the beneficiaries. We talked about the trustee. Let's clarify what their duties are. The trustee's duties. Yeah. So the trustee has a fiduciary obligation, and that is the entity that uh, essentially owns, and I'm doing the air in quotes, quotes commas, yeah. yeah, yeah. So they, they own the assets, but they also the entity that will be sued by the beneficiary or beneficiaries. And, you know, whether mm. it's in five years or 10 years or 30 years time, if there is an incorrect application of their fiduciary duty. There's some very famous lawsuits in that regard. Um, anyone who wants to look up the Pritzker case, that's an interesting Correct. one. So the role of the trustee is to take a decision with the beneficiaries in mind. Always. That's what the role of the trustee is. And it must also be prefaced by saying that when a trustee is applying their fiduciary duty or their decision, they need to look at the deed, the trust deed, because some yes. trust deeds are very prescriptive. And so that's your starting point. What does the deed say? Does a trustee have this discretion? Are we able to apply funds in this particular way? And if so, how does this impact the beneficiary now or down the line? Mm -hmm. And that's what the trustee essentially does. And so let's speak about the trustee in the realm of, of costs, mm -hmm. because that's where it comes in. Yes. When we speak about fees surrounding a trust or the trust that are set up, that is really where the factor comes in is the risk factor. So mm -hmm. there's the work that needs to be done and there's the administration yeah. behind a trust, but you need to, how do you factor risk? And there are, the I can be setting up two trusts with completely different purposes and completely different risk factors. And you've got to look at the type of beneficiaries, number of beneficiaries, jurisdictions. And so that all, oh God, kind of, that all comes states. into play, right? If that one moves all, to the US, right, it just becomes right. a nightmare, but so, yes. So that all comes yeah. into play. So, so the trustee, is essentially the individual or the entity that takes the decision on behalf of the beneficiaries. Yeah, and they're responsible for acting in their best interest. So, I mean, and those responsibilities are the management of the assets, you know, within, in order to meet that responsibility that they have an obligation to those to those people to live up to the contract that has been put in place for the for the trust and just the regular routine maintenance. So the reporting, the tax, the tax filings and right. everything else. Right. The one we didn't talk about yet was the settler. So what's the role of the settler of the trust? Well, that's that's the uh, the certainty of uh, of intent, the yes. individual or entity that wants to set up this vehicle for the benefit of the beneficiaries. So the settler, when setting up a trust, settles the trust. That mm -hmm. concept, there needs to be a settlement property, yes. and we've had settlement properties uh, that are you know a silver coin. Yep a bill, uh, whether it's 10 or 100, and that is uh, retained in the trust file, and that is the settlement There's property. proof that that, hey, this criteria is checked off, and we actually have the physical proof of it. Correct. And so a settler, we have trusts where a settler does just that. They settle the trust, and yeah, there's no other away. involvement. Yeah. And we have other trusts, certainly in the case of a revocable trust, where the settler is very involved. Mm -hmm. um, and we have irrevocable trusts where during the settler's lifetime, they have the ability to communicate 
communicate with the trustee and guide the trustee in terms of certain decisions that need to be taken. One concept in particular is a concept of a protector. And it's something that's becoming a lot more popular. In and my, necessary, man. Yeah, well, in my, in my 15 years in the trust business, Internationally, we've always seen the application of a protector and within Canada, very little of it has been done and we're seeing more and more of it. And yeah. essentially a protector is, could be an individual, it could be a corporation, there are companies out there that offer professional protector services. And that's what it is. It's uh, how does it protect anyone? Well, it protects the settler and the beneficiaries in that, uh, for example, a protector can have the power to hire or fire trustees. Mm -hmm. So if you know the beneficiaries are unhappy with what the trustee is doing or the protector is unhappy with the trustee is doing, they are able to terminate that, uh, that appointment. Mm -hmm. And then you know replace the trustee. Yeah, and even in cases where the trustee becomes basically incapable or dies of handling that trust, they have the power to then name someone else, right? Which is well, now, now you're entering into a realm of who do you appoint as a trustee? Exactly. Uh, should it be an individual, individuals, or should it be a corporation as opposed to an individual? And there's no right or wrong. Yeah, it um, just meets whatever needs you have. Right, but at a high level. And we could talk, we're gonna come to that later, but let's talk about that now. So yeah. individuals can do the job or a company such as your own, a corporate trustee can do the job. So let's talk or about- Or a combination. Or a combination of the, yeah, of the right. two. So let's talk about the trade-offs between between these these different ones. It's longevity. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. It is the, the fact that uh, if you are concerned, so let me take a step back. Lee sets up a trust for his family. Yes. And he's got his buddy, Jason, who's the trustee. Not the actual case, but- yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe one day, we'll see. <laughs> um, same ages. Yeah. And right now it may make a lot of sense. Why? Because- Lee yeah. knows that Jason is really fluid in financial matters and knows that his family is going to be in good hands. And both live to a ripe age of 70 or 80. At that stage, it becomes clear to Lee that having an individual such as Jason as a trustee may not be such a good idea because the reality is there's no guarantee that when Lee dies, that Jason's going to be there to act as a trustee. Mm -hmm. And that's what we mainly see as the primary reason for individuals contacting a corporate trustee. The second is just understanding the business, knowing what needs to be done. There are so many changes that really come through, whether it's a budget announcement or legislative changes that have an or, impact or a on trust. Case in, right. in the media. Oh, right. sorry, in the, in the courts, it right. happens. Right. Yeah. And so it's just understanding the business, and when a decision needs to be taken that you know that as a trustee, let's speak about liability again, as a trustee, you're liable for the decision that you're taking. And so don't think that by me or Lee appointing Jason, I am doing Jason any favors. It's certainly not the case. It's like I say about executorship, stop fighting over it. It's not an honor. <laughs> it's, and unfortunately, a lot of individuals do not see it that way. I know, unfortunately, right. until they get the job and then they're like, what did I just sign up for? Right. So, okay, so that's- Can, can I yeah, speak about- yeah, um, the, should you have one individual, two individuals, multiple as trustees in the combination? Yes, let's talk about that. How many so, trustees so, you need? So where you have, where you want to, so the disadvantage of a corporate trustee is the cost factor. Yes. Right? Because it costs money. But the longevity, the professionalism, you know, those, and, and, the, and the competency, like those are the, right. those are the yeah, benefits. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. agree with that. My experience is that where individuals are appointed as trustees, it's cost is a big factor, but what lands up happening is when they need to act as a trustee, there's uncertainty on what their rights are or what the right thing to do is, yeah. and now they go seek legal opinion, and, and the cost ultimately back the up. trust lands up paying for that. And so it's penny wise, pound foolish. Down yeah. the line, do what's right for the family, and you got this a certain element of gut, a gut feeling, like you know what makes sense over here. Yeah. It also if, eliminates issues like family dynamics, right? Like one sibling gets named a trustee, the other ones don't. You know, there's conflict there. Don't underestimate that. Yeah, it's uh, a huge factor. It's, uh, it's you know why do you have to now decide when I get money when mom and dad died? You know, we should have been equal in this. And I had this conversation two days ago. Right, and it's yeah. Uh, yeah, it's real. It's a reality, and unfortunately, money makes people do strange things. Very strange. So, if you are going to appoint an individual as a trustee, it's common sense that don't have one trustee, or if you are, have at least a successor trustee. Mm -hmm. In the event of something happening to that individual, they're not mm -hmm. no longer able to act as a trustee. So you can have one, or you know, two, Typically, three. Yeah. 
But if you have more than one, typically it's three. You want a tiebreaker somewhere, right? Right. Yeah. But but you know, at the end of the day, also think about successor appointments because life is life. You know, there are no guarantees. Absolutely. Right. There are no guarantees. Yeah, and it's uh, and actually there's some there's some use cases where if you don't have three, it calls the entire thing into question, right? So getting advice on how a trust is properly structured is hugely hugely. Do not cheap out and go to the cheapest lawyer you can find. This is an area that has a fair degree of complexity, and yet the make sure you get this right because otherwise it's just money spent for nothing quite honestly yeah it's uh i agree with the notion that first and foremost get advice absolutely but isn't it bizarre that individuals spend most of their working life aiming to retire financially secure and at that time and we deal with clients that during that process they want to set up these structures to look for for estate planning purposes but how often we sit down with individuals and they haggle over you know whether it's it's price or intent and it's 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 bizarre to me that this is what you've worked your whole life for you've now amounted a certain net worth yes this is what you should be doing to protect that net worth. Yeah. Not only for you and your spouse, but for generations the, to come, hopefully. The next generation, right? Yeah. And so I'm not saying that that's generally the case, but we've had experiences with, where, where we have those discussions with clients. I've also had that conversation <laughs> the last two weeks. So yeah, we jumped ahead to where, from where I wanted to go, but this is good because we covered a lot of ground. Let's actually start talking about the use cases. Right. Um, so very quickly, all trusts fall into one of two categories, inter vivo, set up while you're alive, and testamentary, set up while you're dead. But there's a number of use cases or other other terms for trusts or, or labels that get slapped on them for very good reason that all have different implications or different use cases. And one thing I actually want to tackle before we go any further, and I should have said this early on, a lot of people don't realize this. They think trusts are this big tax play. And you and I both know there's only really two types of trusts in this types of trusts in this country that have any kind of tax preference whatsoever. Otherwise, people are usually surprised to find this out. Trusts pay the highest marginal tax Correct. rate in this country. Yeah. So if well, they you, do now. Back in the, the beautiful golden days, there was definitely some more advantages to, uh, to testamentary trusts up through your will, but those are largely gone. So actually, let's talk about the ones that happen while you pass away and how they can be tax advantageous. So the two, the first one kind of a trust is a graduated rate of state. So let's talk about what a GRE or graduated rate of state is. Yeah. So this has to do with the taxation of trusts. And yes. um, ultimately, it's the obligation of the trustee is ensuring that uh, when they file the income tax returns of the trust, the taxation of trusts uh, has gone through some significant changes. That's putting so, it lightly. Yeah. So, <laughs> so ultimately, the there's no benefits, generally speaking, in, in a trust holding on to to its income because it is going to be subject to the to the, the the maximum or the marginal highest marginal tax rate. Where we see application for a lot of the trust in certainly for business owners, it involves an element of loaning funds to a trust where they apply prescribed rates. So mm -hmm. uh, individual loans- A rate uh, set by the government. Uh, it yep. is set by the government. The most attractive that it's been is 1%. So you loan, let's say $10 million to a trust. Those were good days. The individual <laughs> um, by the 30th of January or the first 30 days in the year, it would get their interest on that loan. And so that's to avoid the element of attribution back mm -hmm. to the individual. And then what it allows the trust to do is, let's say the, the, the 10 million is invested and the beneficiaries are wife and kids. It allows for the trust to then pay for the kids, uh, you know, whether it's activities or education mm -hmm. or any expenses relating to the kids. And whether it's a matriarch that sets up the trust or patriarch that sets up the trust, the spouse is generally a beneficiary. It also then allows for the spouse to receive income from the mm -hmm. trust or capital. Yeah. But the intent is that there's some element of splitting, income splitting that takes place, utilizing the trust. And that's a huge tax ad and to be clear, advantage. Like, that actually with a spouse doesn't require a trust. You can do a loan you to can. the trust. So you can. this is something that does not require this level of complexity. However, with the kids, it becomes an issue, right? Because basic kids are minors. Who is in charge of that money? Who, again, this is the control aspect Correct. of this, right? So that's why, especially when we're, when we're doing, um, I actually just did the accounting for this recently, when you're doing a case like this that involves uh, money to the benefit of, a ch of children, you don't want to, well, you need to have something like this set up because of the control aspect. So yeah, so that's, it's good we tackle that. So the, there is a degree of income splitting, so there can be a tax benefit. However, that tax benefit 
is uh, depends on how many kids you have, <laughs> right? So, uh, and there's limitations. You can't just go having uh, you know half a million dollars in, in gains per year paid to a child and pay far lower rates. They've become down very hard on that, right? If this is done for the maintenance of the kids. You know, where's your proof that you paid all this in expenses, right? So things like contributions to education funds are fine. Things like paying for their camp are fine, but they've gotten particular. I mean, I've seen ones where. I've heard of cases where they tried to put through like family vacations. The kid had to pay their right. own way the family vacation. CRA saying, yeah. you're going on that family yeah. vacation. Right. You're not getting that. Congratulations, you went to Aruba. You spend, you know, two grand on that. The kids, no, that doesn't qualify. Right. So can't live the lavish lifestyle on the trust. So I hope my parents listen to the, the podcast. <laughs> uh, Mom, dad, where's my trip to Aruba? There you go. Yeah. So um, I mentioned graduate rate of state. So that's kind of, so what happens with those? Those are basically you pass away, your, your money goes into his state. And everybody, of course, thinks, okay, let's pay it out to the beneficiaries. But there's an advantage to not paying it out to beneficiaries for a couple of years. Fair to speak. So, so let, me, let me ask you, when, when you're dealing with clients yep. and when you're specifically dealing with graduated rates, uh, estates, where is it that is a stumbling block? Where is it that they see the light and saying, this is where the benefit yeah. of the trust is? So, and that's a good question. So the benefit to the graduated rate estate is that they pay, quote unquote, graduated rates. So they pay as if you do. So you are allowed a certain amount, you know, you pay more money on, so you pay more taxes, the more money you make, right? So right. It's, you get to take advantage of lower, right. lower tax rates. Everything's not taxed at 53. They get taxed at 20, then 30 and whatever else. So there is a but, savings, right? right? So where is it? I mean, the reality is, and these are still relatively new, but the issue is, is that the intent is I want to wrap this thing up. Like, you know, my, my father, mother, whatever it is, passed away. Let's just get this thing settled. You know, I've got loans to pay. I've got whatever else to do. And I just don't want to deal with the headache of this, right? And you have to say, no, wait a sec. You know, there's an advantage. Right. There's an advantage here. You know, if, if the estate is $50,000, it's probably Fair not enough. worth doing right. it, right? Yeah. But if there is, let's just use a round number of a million bucks. A million dollars is in the estate. And that estate is even at, let's just say 5% it earns for the year. Now we're talking $50,000 in income. We have to look at who the beneficiaries are. If the beneficiaries are low income and there's multiple beneficiaries, you know, say five of them, 10 grand is not going to make a big dent. It's right. not really necessarily worth it. But if there's say one beneficiary and that person already earns top level income, so you're looking at 50,000 that would be taxed at say 50 In addition to right. Right now, the difference between what they would pay in the trust versus what they would pay personally is a tax advantage, right? right? One that is blessed by the government for that right. matter. Right. So there is a cost to keeping this open because you have to file the taxes every year. But if we're talking 10, 15, $20,000 in tax savings per year for three years, hey, that's an advantage, right. especially if you have a bunch of beneficiaries in larger amounts, right? So that's really the the play there. It, it, the stumbling block is, congratulations, you inherited this money. You know, unfortunately, someone right. died and for it, but you can't touch it for three years. That's what we, enc shouldn't. we encounter the, the difficulty in you've inherited, but there's some benefit in holding back on when you receive the, the funds from the trust. But in all honesty, it's a discussion. It doesn't and, have to be all or none, right? right? Right. And so it is a discussion around the time value of money and he has the implication of receiving the funds now versus, yeah. you know, waiting down the line. And sometimes we often will draft this into the will with their intent. So sometimes often a lot of procedures in wills is people will worry they're going to ruin their kids with too much money in one shot, even if they're adult. So sometimes you see phase rollouts of, of disbursements, right? So instead of getting it all up front, I'm going to spend, I'm going to give you order per year for the next four years, right? Well, that that by nature, by its very nature, creates the opportunity for the graduate rate of the state to take advantage of those tax Correct. brackets. Yeah. So yeah, but it's, um, it is the entire like, you know, especially when they're expecting the money to say, well, you might not want to take it now. There's an old statistic that says that when someone picks up a lottery check because they want it, 50% of the money's gone already, just on average. Unfortunately, with inheritances, I'm willing to think it's probably about the same. Yeah. 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 Sticking to the, the benefits of inheriting and along the lines of taxation, the one trust which we discussed prior to the podcast is a trust that's set up for beneficiaries with disabilities. Now that's the big one. And, and so we've been contacted on a regular basis to act as a trustee for what is commonly known as a Henson Trust. And I'm not sure what the general school of thought is amongst uh, corporate trustees. Mm -hmm. And so here's the one benefit of a corporate trustee is that you want to make sure that whatever happens, that not only is there someone that's going to look after the funds because it's intended for an individual with a disability, mm -hmm. and whether it includes a physical or a cognitive disability, 
It's both, but when it comes to cognitive disabilities, there's a greater importance on who you appoint as a trustee. Especially in cases right. where maybe it's a small family, they don't have anyone else that they know. I've had this encounter where it's like, I don't have anyone I can name. Right. Right. And, and so there, it's not so much how much is going into the trust. That's so not a, a net worth discussion. Mm -hmm. It's a necessity. Because if I have an, 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 an environment, I myself am an immigrant, mm -hmm. but where you're dealing with uh, you know, a population where there are so many immigrants, the reality is that there are a lot of individuals that just don't have the support or the next of kin in the country they live yes. or the province they live to act as a trustee. Yeah. Right? And it does not help appointing Brother Joe, uh, who lives whether in the U.S. or Brother Joe, especially who lives, if it's in the U.S., uh, you know, in another country, yeah. it just it doesn't work. No. So, from a Henson Trust point of view, that's I was saying earlier, you know, the general school of thought for us. Our preference is to act as a co-trustee, and why we do that is, and I think there's logic to this. If you're dealing with an individual, certainly with a cognitive disability, there is no way a corporate trustee will develop that type of relationship with that beneficiary to truly understand that beneficiary's needs. Yes. And that's where there's a co-trustee or stating it differently. If corporate trustee is a sole trustee, who is the individual or entity that they can discuss the beneficiary's needs? Mm -hmm. So that the caregiver, the, the right. whoever, whoever's there to right. support their day-to-day -day right. requirements. And so from our you know, the reason why we start the discussion saying we need a co-trustee is to put this yeah, front you're and not, center. You're not the one look, overlooking them and their needs, Absolutely right? Absolutely not. Right. So, you know, Henson's Trust specifically exists in the law, specifically available only to people, to beneficiaries who have disabled needs. Right. And first, I'll ta tackle the tax issue. So this actually allows for graduated rates, graduated rates as well. Yes, And this is the only other exemption we have under Canadian tax right. code right now. Right. And then frankly, I don't think anyone's going to get too fussed about someone who's disabled basically getting this benefit. And this is, this is of paramount importance because this protects a number of other benefits they may be entitled to. Yeah, the Ontario um, Disability Support Program. Mm -hmm. And so the, the reason why a Henson Trust is considered is so that the assets that are in the trust do not form part of the net worth of the, the disabled beneficiary. Exactly. And so it still allows the beneficiary to, to tap into some of the, the grants that are available out there. And, uh, and so what the trust does, it just lends financial support. And so th this, has been, this has been contested. It's, it's gone so to the court. A recent uh, BC uh, case where they, that's uh, correct. they wanted right. to, was a subsidized housing, wanted that's to right. say, you're disqualified because you have this trust to support your lifestyle. Correct, correct. Yeah. And, and it was the BC court ruled against the, the Henson Trust, but the Supreme Court upheld it. Uh, upheld it. Yeah. And so, yeah, so there's recent, and I think that that's the testament to any type of planning is where there is, actual case, um, yeah. a case study, and uh, you know, you're know you able it's to- all, It's all hearsay until it goes through the Supreme yeah, Court. Right, yeah. and so, but I think, I think it's good that it was upheld. So to echo your point, the Supreme Court you know, ultimately saw this as a viable planning tool for individuals with, yeah. with disabilities. And again, this is like, let, let's keep in mind, I mean, I'm sure some people are gonna jump to the conclusion, well, that's not fair. You know, if there's like $10 million in this trust, then you know, maybe they shouldn't qualify for government services. Well, yeah, that's an extreme case, but it's also a very, 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 very minor case. I mean, we're talking about, you know, the typical planning I do around this involves households that are far more modest. I agree. And, and frankly, yeah, there's enough money left behind to hopefully take care of that person. Maybe they buy a small insurance policy to help insure that, or maybe it's a large one, whatever it might be. But we're not talking about making sure that basically billionaires' children are going to be taken care of and be able to take government's, government's money. We're yeah. talking about people where, hey, they can even live the most baseline life that, sub, that government subsidies will permit them, which is not very much. Or they can live one that actually has some semblance like normal. Normalcy. I think you know. Once again, the starting point with the Henson Trust is the fact that you're dealing with the beneficiary with a disability, and yep. that's that's the starting point. That's it, right? right. And, and frankly, we should not be too fussed about graduate rates for those people. Right. So that's those are the ones that are tax advantageous. Everything else, again, top marginal. But there's still lots of really good reasons to use some of these. So I'll let you pick whatever one you want to talk next about. Because I got a short list here myself. Yeah. So so we uh, we see a fair amount of uh, planning uh, utilizing a spousal trust. So spousal trust. Um, and alter ego trusts. Yep. Uh, so alter ego trusts, you need to be 65. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially what it is, it's, it is a tax play in that you, you, Different you, type roll, of tax you, throw, you throw your assets into the trust and the individual who settles the trust during their lifetime, they are able to utilize 
the income in that trust. And on their death, then the funds uh, then flow over to the spouse on a tax efficient basis. So ultimately tax is paid, it's mm-hmm. just a deferral mechanism. So yeah, so let's, let's, let's specify on the, on the alter ego in particular. So again, over 65, one thing that's unique about this one is that when you move assets that have gains into a trust, you're typically gonna trigger that tax. However, when with an alter ego, you don't. Correct. Right? And really, I mean, when you talk about a tax play, the real tax play there is that this is no longer part of the estate. So therefore, because it's a separate legal entity and it has beneficiaries after that, but it flows through to the it flows through the beneficiaries without probate. Correct. Right? And let's not to get too fussed about probate. It's you know one point five percent in Ontario, more or less elsewhere, depending where you are. But it's still something. And frankly, we can plan around it. Right. Absolutely. The spousal trust is an interesting one. I always talk about this. Let's talk about the intent of that. Um, I have my own funny story so, for that. But <laughs> so, well, now, now, let me now, do it. Now I'm interested. So I basically, whenever I teach, I, I, so whenever I, I teach uh, financial planning and I give examples of trust, I said, you know, this solves what I call the quote unquote cabana boy problem, right? <laughs> you know, the, the spouse who's in a sensitive situation and ends up basically, the joke is, you know, they end up marrying the much younger spouse or whatever it is. And that younger spouse is going to try to quote unquote screw the kids out of the deceased's, you know, hard earned money. Right. So really, you know, let's talk about and how by implication the deceased, the beneficiaries or the next generation. Exactly. Right, so right, my, right. you know, my wife would probably never do this. Um, <laughs> probably. But my wife ends up being a very wealthy individual because I died, left all kinds of money behind and marries a much younger man who's right. basically got his sights set on defrauding my children. Right. And, you know, he tries to get all the money and, and runs off. Like, that's that's the fear that happens. And it's not one that's undue because God knows, I mean, like you're in a sensitive situation. I mean, Paul McCartney's second marriage didn't go that well, right? Like these sort of things happen. Right. So tell us how spousal trust helps prevent that. From well, happening. I mean, essentially, so with the spousal trust, if you take the principles of an alter ego trust, the spousal trust, it allows the husband and wife or allows the uh, common law partners to benefit from the income and capital of their trust during their lifetime. On their death, mm-hmm. then like any trust deed, it will have who the beneficiaries of the trust uh, is or are. And it could be individuals. And the one thing we haven't touched on is it could be a charitable yeah, you know, well, foundation. Yes. So, so there's there's a list of, of beneficiaries that would ultimately benefit from from the trust. And so, yeah, yeah to, you know, to paraphrase the, the Cabana Boy problem, yeah, <laughs> it, what it does, it, it has that framework where it clearly stipulates who the who can benefit from those assets mm-hmm. during the spouse's lifetime and on the death of the last surviving spouse, then you know yeah. the, there's there's a list of beneficiaries. Yeah, so that spouse could be entitled to say just the income from those assets, Correct. but the capital's got to be preserved for the kids. Correct. Right? Correct. So thereby foiling the Cabana Boy's evil intent. Right. <laughs> right. So yeah, you, you touched upon one just now, uh, charity. So let's talk about the concept of a charitable remainder trust. Are you seeing many of these? Because I'm not seeing many of these. I mean, what we're seeing is we're seeing, you know, if you take the concept of intervivos and testamentary, we're seeing a lot of foundations that are being set up during individuals' lifetime. An so, actual trust foundation. So it's an actual foundation that's being set up. And there are a number of, you know, so, so let's, let's take a step back. And why would, uh, you know, the concept of charity and philanthropy and giving back. And, you know, we have families that they've done well, or we have families that have taken out a life policy and they feel very passionate about a certain cause. And they want to make sure that certain funds are left to a particular charity. And in that instance, it's generally, you know, structured through a will where there's a policy and the policy is intended for a B or C charitable mm-hmm. initiative. I plan on bringing Mark on to talk about that. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. in terms of the foundations, we have uh, families that have sold businesses and there's this desire to give back. And uh, that desire is usually fulfilled through a community foundation of some sort or setting up a private foundation. There's also the concept of what's a donor, it's known as a donor advice fund. Mm-hmm. And this is essentially where there's, think of it's an umbrella and you know clients uh, and individuals can open up a family foundation in the family's name under this umbrella. And benefits of donor advice funds um, is that it generally allows for the family to get involved in what the true intent is, which is gifting. Mm-hmm. And so it's an opportunity for families to sit around the table and discuss the fun part of philanthropy. Who's going to benefit from the funds that are in the foundation? And, and what the donor advice fund's responsibility is, like a trustee, and so we have a lot of donor advice funds out there that are set up as trusts. They could be set up as corporations. So the, the one benefit 
of a donor advised fund is that uh, it takes care of the administrative and regulatory obligations. Mm -hmm. And the foundations in Canada have a minimum distribution requirement of three and a half percent. So the obligation of the trustee of the donor advice fund is to ensure that the family meets that minimum requirement. Yep, and those are useful because I mean, you know, when you start talking about charitable foundations, normally you're talking about pretty sizable dollars. And donor advised funds, there's organizations in this country that will start these as low as twenty five thousand. Right. Right. And so important point there, you wouldn't be setting up a private foundation for your family. No. In my mind, unless you're really looking to put aside, you know, two million plus, yeah. doesn't really make a lot when of you sense. start looking at the cost of, of actually administering that, right. it's sizable. It's like you're it's you got to step an operation for that, right. right? And but that's that being said, though, I mean, two million is a high bar. So I mean, a lot of and what we've seen is seen, I've seen some smaller to moderate sized. Uh, charities basically roll themselves into a donor advised fund to yeah. basically create this kind of pooled outsourcing mechanism. Right. For- so, so what what we have seen yeah. is individuals, notwithstanding their desire to give back, yeah. so not notwithstanding their philanthropic desire, if they want to set up a, a foundation, and if there's a tax element to that because they're going to get a tax receipt. Yes. Right. If they try and set up a private foundation. Any time after, I would say, beginning of August, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, no. Because CRA, just, no. You, you need to apply to CRA and they need to approve that and you get a charitable number. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. So it's not uncommon for us to have clients that walk through the door and say, look, um, you know, my advisor said, uh, this is uh, something that I need to do. Or I want to do this. This is what my family wants to do. Our family wants to do this, but we just don't have the time. Can we set up an account under the donor advice fund with the intent that down the line, when we set up our private foundation, we'll then transfer that. And, and we can because once that private foundation is set up, it is a registered charity. And so it's a move from donor advised registered charity to a registered charity in their private foundation. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's 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 great because it's basically, for lack of a better term, off the shelf. You can basically set these things right. up. You know, forget August. You can set these things up in December. Right. right. Like it's, it's, it's a little bit of paperwork and a donation and you're off to the races. And then you can get the rest of this stuff taken care of. Right. Good. Now, must be said that generally, once the donor advice fund is set up, that families see the benefit of having someone partner with them and take care of the administrative burden and leave the gifting part to the yeah, family. Exactly. Right? They still, they, you know, I often talk about that sort of strategy. When I talk about the estate planning or we talk about the tax planning, you know, we talk about how, you know, if this is, if your goal is to have, you know, responsibility or social responsibility conversations with your, with your kids and try to instill upon them a, a sense of responsibility towards giving to the world, outside world, then these types of things are, are wonderful, right? Because especially with donor advised funds, you have the flexibility to, basically give money to any charity that's registered, right? right? So they can have a conversation around the dinner table about we have this much money to allocate this year. What do we feel strongly about? Who are we going to get to? Right. Yeah. yeah. So you're right when you say registered charity, but registered domestic domestic charity, charity right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we often uh, with the fires in Australia, we had clients that asked us to transfer funds to an Australian charity. And we had to find a local charity that ultimately was a conduit for that, that, right? Yeah. 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 So, so let me let me touch on an experience that I've had with a number of clients around donor advice funds and the value of donor advice funds or foundations, just generally, mm-hmm. irrespective. We have a family; they've taken the opportunity with their foundation to hold uh, regular family meetings, and what they've allowed each of their three kids, including uh, wife and husband, to do is every year they are able to gift $25,000 to a charity of their choice. Mm -hmm. With every dollar that is gifted, that dollar goes into a common pot. And the intent of the common pot is that at the end or prior to the end of the year, there needs to be a unanimous decision amongst family members where the common funds go to Hmm. charitable cause. And the reason it was done is that there was discourse amongst family members Mm -hmm. and it was an incredible tool to bring family members around the table and to resolve not only the the good of gifting, right, the, Mm -hmm. the philanthropic intent, but also to resolve issues among family members. And it also allowed the next generation to witness how mom and dad, how they carry on a conversation with the advisory team um, with their foundation. Mm. Uh, it was just you know, spectacular. It's a great mechanism a for kind of getting them involved in the family operations. Right. So, and, yeah. Yeah. So, so make no mistake that the intention was for, uh, for good, but there was, uh, there was an element 
of uh, <laughs> trying to resolve issues amongst the family members. Excellent. So before we wrap up, I just gonna sum it up. I mean, end of the day, trusts are an incredibly valuable and useful tool that can be very dynamic and used in any number of ways. We covered only a bit of what can be done, right? You know, we're talk- we talked about charity, we talked about people with disabilities, we talked about protecting money for the next generation, protecting money from spendthrift kids to some degree, right? And then also they can be used in uh, Ted Maduri on the previous episode, we talked about how to structure with a trust uh, in order to basically, you know, for, for various tax optimization st- uh, strategies, but incredibly, incredibly valuable. And unfortunately in current media, misunderstood tool. Very uh, much so. Very misunderstood. Uh, so do not demonize educate, and they can be incredibly useful to any business owner out there and even non-business owners. So before we wrap up, where can people find you, Lee? They're able to go to Seidel's website, mm-hmm. uh, Seidel.com, and uh, contact details are there. Excellent. And uh, we have offices in Toronto and Calgary, so yeah. we definitely uh, have and, a national footprint. And how many other countries? Uh, we have uh, two other countries. Uh, <laughs> two? Uh, yeah, two. <laughs> okay. Two other countries, yes. various offices. But especially, I will say, the U.S. might go to anytime, uh, anytime it starts crossing borders, you're the first ones I call. Oh, thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So that was my interview with Lee Fernandez. I hope you enjoyed that. If we were to talk about everything a trust could do, we'd be here for days. So uh, they hopefully, like I said, you took away that these are dynamic structures that can be used in planning and can benefit you and your family and help you meet your goals. So until next time, I'm Jason Pereira. Take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals, business owners, and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, and SoundCloud. For more episodes, go to jasonperera.ca. You can even ask Surrey, Alexa, or Google Home to subscribe for you.